Well, good evening, everyone. Diane Young here from South Pacific Private. And tonight we're going to be talking about boundaries for beginners. Before we start that, I wanted to pay my respects to our, the Aboriginal elders, past, present and future on the land in which we work and South Pacific resides is the land of the Gay Magal people of the Eora Nation. And um, I'm just going to wait a minute or two as people start to log on and uh, after the busyness of the day. Uh, and you'll see behind me I have a whiteboard, so I'm going to do a little bit of whiteboarding tonight uh, just to mix it up a bit. So as many of you know, at South Pacific we work with the model of developmental immaturity and when Pia Melody was putting this together, she talked about the various aspects that, of what a child needs to be uh, supported into functional adulthood. And one of the things that she said was that children need to be allowed to be appropriately vulnerable. And if we think about, you know, the model in and of itself, we're talking about from the ages of naught to 18. And that's quite a, you know, long period of time. It's four different ego states through it. It, it encompasses attachment theory and all of those things. But when you think about children from naught to 18, we go through various stages of being vulnerable. Of course, when we're in the early stages of uh, naught to four, we're very little. We don't know how to do very many things. We're being taught many, many things. And we're learning at a very fast rate. We're learning language. We're learning dexterity with our fingers. We're learning how to moderate uh, and uh, get reciprocity from our caregivers. Uh, and then we go from the age of um, five to seven to the next stage where we're uh, learning, uh, then eight to ten and then th thirteen plus up to teenage years. And at each point we're in a very different state and we're very, uh, it's a different amount of ability to learn to regulate ourselves. What are boundaries? Well, in boundaries in and of themselves are invisible force fields. We learn them from our caregivers. Uh, we may have a, perhaps we have a parent, perhaps we have a, one parent who's very uh, boundaryless, uh, who doesn't actually uh, exhibit any beginning and end. And in our world, we would call that being enmeshed with a parent. The parents are meshed with us. And we may have a parent who's walled and very defended. And as a child, we learn how to be in relationship from watching, watching how our parents are in relationship with each other, and of course, experiencing how they're in relationship with us. Now, there are different types of boundaries, uh, and I want to just uh, talk a moment for uh, about boundaries. So when the nature of a child is that we're allowed to be appropriately vulnerable and that's age appropriate. And if we're not allowed to be age appropriate, if we're not supported in, an, in, a, in a way that su uh, emotionally supports us, we'll not trust being vulnerable. So I often give the example for the, you know, primary age child comes home, um, you know, let's just say me. I come home from school, I'm primary age child, I've got, you know, my one best friend at school, and she says to me, I don't want to be your friend anymore, Diane. I want to be friends with Mary. I, have no, I don't know what's happening. Why, why is this happening? I'm little. I feel totally confused by this. I don't know what to do with it. What I do know is I don't want to let them see me cry. So I hold it together for the day. And when I get home, I say to mum, Mary doesn't want to be my friend anymore. She's going to be friends with somebody else. And uh, rather than have some care and compassion shown to me as a child, 
Mum dismisses it. Don't worry about that. I, I, I didn't like Mary's mother anyway. I'd rather you were friends with Jane. Now, if, if a parent in a dysfunctional family system dismisses how we're feeling and apologises for it shortly thereafter, we can learn from it. But if it's constantly, if this is the constant experience we're getting from our parent without an apology, we talk about this being a dysfunctional family system. And the best definition I've heard about dysfunctional family system is don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. And the clients I've worked with who have had that experience understand those three. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. We go along a little bit and what we don't learn is boundaries. If we're not allowed to be appropriately vulnerable, we don't learn boundaries. And there's three types of boundaries. There's an internal boundary talking and listening, there's an external boundary, and there's a sexual boundary. And we get them by, as I said earlier, observing how our parents interact uh, with each other, and how they interact with us, and how they interact with the world around them. So I want to just talk to you a bit about um, I think sometimes the visual's helpful, so I'm going to do a bit of stuff on the whiteboard, uh, and I and I hope you find it helpful. So follow me here. So I'm just realising I've made a terrible mistake here, so I'm going to cut that out there. <laughs> so in a, you know, when when we're in the nature of a child, we want to be allowed to be appropriately vulnerable. If we don't learn. If we're not allowed to do that, we don't learn boundaries. If we don't learn boundaries, we will sit in a space of too vulnerable or invulnerable. Now, the interesting thing about this is this looks very black and white. And where a lot of people get tripped up with boundaries is this. So if we're talking about, you'll get to see my great stick figures, by the way, it's very exciting for me to be able to share this with you. So, external boundary moves depending on who you're with. If you're with an intimate partner, you're, you know, you're, you're right next to them. They're here. You know, if you're with your child, here. You know, close friend may be the same. Uh, so this is the external boundary. And this moves. So if you're standing at the, you know, ATM machine, for example, and you're, you know, pressing the buttons and do whatever you've got to do, if someone's too close to you, you'll feel it. You'll feel it behind you. And it's happened to me where they've been too close, and I've said, can I just have a little space, please? And usually it's because they've got their head in their phone, they don't actually pay any attention to me. And they move, of course, straight away. And you'll know that if you... You know, you might be standing in a queue somewhere and you're just, you know, waiting your turn, but something behind, you have a sense that there's someone behind you that you don't feel comfortable about and nothing's been said. And what you'll notice you do, if that happens, is you'll turn on the side. Now, you won't move around and necessarily stare at the person, but you'll move, you'll just kind of turn to protect yourself. And it's interesting to watch that because sometimes I think in our fast-paced world now, we've sort of lost the art of tuning in to the energy that's around us in the world. The second boundary is an internal boundary. Now, this is the one that is from your heart to your abdomen. And many people don't know about this one. And many people don't have it. So it's from your heart to your abdomen and it protects your truth. It actually allows you to contain yourself and be protected from others. So for example, when we're talking about the internal boundary, we're talking about, you know, if someone says something to you that's a bit harsh, say, if you don't have a solid internal boundary and you've maybe got a few self-esteem issues, let's say, you'll take it in like it's a truth. So if someone said to me, 
Someone said, no one's ever said this, by the way. But if someone said to me, oh, Diane, you're a dreadful therapist. I'm not going to come and see you, right? No one said it, by the way. Uh, I've got a fairly solid internal boundary and so my response to that would not be to cr collapse in a heap because I think that, that it's true. My response would be to ask for more information. So tell me why you are saying that to me. What is it in our relationship that makes you say that? Can I have some more information about it? Can I have more data? And, and what you do when someone says something that's harsh to you and you have an internal boundary, you're in a position where you can allow them to say what they need to say without taking it on. Now, just a little moment ago, we were talking before we were coming on to this Facebook Live event and a um, CEO said to me, having boundaries, let me see if I can get this quote right, having boundaries allows us to be more compassionate. Now you think about that. You initially would think to yourself, hang on a second, is that right? But when you consider, if I have a solid internal boundary, a malleable but movable external boundary, and someone says something to me that's harsh, or someone behaves in a way that I think's um, you know, not great. I can I can hold myself in my own. It's like we I can stay in my own lane. It's a word we you know kind of we use a lot, and allow them to have their experience. Maybe to be dysregulated for a bit. Maybe to be upset, and not take it on like it's mine. This is the value of boundaries because ultimately what we want as a functional adult, you see over here, protect and contain ourselves. Protect and contain the self. It stops me from being un, uh, dysregulated and coming out and abusing you and allows me to regulate and know what's mine and what's yours and be in a position to ask for more information. Now, one of the things uh, I want to say also is that there's, the, there's a number of statements we have, you know. I can choose who I let close to me, who I allow to come into my inner world. I get that choice if I have an external boundary that I'm aware of. And I've got to be conscious of this. I can also determine whom I allow behind my internal boundary. Now, this is not Pia Melody's, by the way, this is Diane Young's, but let's try it anyway. So, I have a thing here. Oh, yes, here we are. So, when, when I'm talking about boundaries, internal boundaries particularly, this is, what I, this is often how I explain it to clients. And I don't even know where I got it from, but it makes sense to me, so I hope it helps you. So, in my world, there's three different levels of people. In this little tiny circle there, they are what I call the 100 percenters. Now, they are the people in my life that I let behind my internal boundary. That when I'm having a relationship with them, I'm open, uh, I'm, you know, I'm speaking very plainly about things that are quite important to me that I feel uh, I wouldn't necessarily share with everybody because I wouldn't necessarily feel safe enough to share with everybody. It may be of an intimate nature or it may be just as I'm processing things and I'm thinking things through. These will be people that I will want their advice from, you know. What do you think about this? When I talk about this, how do you feel? What are you hearing me say, right? On a good day, it might be, there could be six people in there. It's not very many when you think about it. Do you know when I was young, much a long, long time ago, I used to think to myself, when I, you know, I've got all these friends and they're just, you know, I've got so many of them and I socialise and all that sort of stuff. And I was staggered one day when a woman, and who was probably my age that I am now, 
said to me, oh, if you count, if you can count six friends on your, you know, six six friends uh, in your life, you richly blessed. And I thought that's ridiculous. I've got many more than that. But I now that see the wisdom of her her views. Now, in that hundred percent, for example, for me, there's a supervisor, there's the therapist. I pay them to keep quiet. So that only leaves four other people. It's my family, the people I love the most. Now the next thing out, the next circle out is the set, what I call the 70 percenters. And the 70 percenters, they are the people, a lot of them know the other 30 percent about me, but it's not what I talk about to them. And they're people, there's quite a lot in that category. They're people I run with in my life, I've known for a long time. They, you know, those friends that I've had for a long time that I don't necessarily see a lot, but, you know, when I do see them, it's like I saw them yesterday, that kind of stuff, right? Then this group, the next one out, not so many, 30 percenters, right? Now I say that often, so this is like the greengrocer, right? He knows I've got a dog named Charlie, very handsome, by the way, and uh, he knows I walk him in the morning. He always remembers the dog's name. He doesn't necessarily remember mine. The only time we talk is when the politics is on and we're debating what's going to happen or when, he, when the peaches or the white chair, the white... White peaches and the cherries are in there, yells out and tells me, right? He doesn't, he doesn't care much about any of the rest of my life, except that I spend some money at his greengrocer shop, right? And then, there's everybody else. Now, when I'm talking about internal boundaries and who I open mine for, whom I allow myself to be really open and vulnerable with, for me, it's the 100 percenters. You know, some of the 70s maybe, but it's mainly the 100 percenters. So I, you know, I hope that makes sense to you because I often say to clients, you have a lot of power in your life. You have more power in your life than you realise because you can choose who's in what category. And at any point in your life, you can change where they are. I've had people that are in the 100 percent category that are out here. No harm, no foul. If I see them, it's, we're appropriately polite and pleasant. But once upon a time in my life, they're in the 100% category. Things change. Ex-husbands, for example. There you go. You know, sometimes girlfriends. Things go wrong with, you know, things kind of get topsy-turvy with. So I, I quite like that idea because it, I actually have a sense that I have power over what happens to me. Now, the same can be applied when we're talking about... That's in terms of the internal boundaries. I think most people understand external boundaries because energetically we feel it. And sexual boundaries are who, who am I? I get to decide who I'm sexual with, when I'm sexual with and how I'm sexual. That is my choice as a human being on the planet. And again, we have a lot of power in that. So I just want to say one thing more about boundaries. And perhaps there's some questions, I'm not sure. You might have questions, you might not. Maybe I've answered them all, who knows. Um, when we were talking about being appropriately vulnerable as a child, not understanding what boundaries are, and going from too vulnerable to invulnerable, the thing I want to say about this is that in the middle of that is this. We will often say, um, too vulnerable, right? which is no boundary. So we're, we're actually at the whim of everybody in the world. We take responsibility for things that are not ours. We take responsibility for the state of the world when we can't, we can only do our little bit here. We do all sorts of things when we've got no boundary. The other boundary that we have, or the other, and that's too vulnerable. This one is walls. Now, walls is, is in fact, it's impenetrable. And if you live with walls, internal, external perhaps, but particularly internal, boundaries as walls. Nobody gets in, nobody gets to connect with you deeply, and you don't get out. So oftentimes when we're dealing with very severe addiction, 
and we're talking about people when they're uh, uh, actually in their active addiction, they'll be all over the place and they'll probably have no boundaries. And then when they try and pull up on their own without help, they'll go to walls because they're terrified. They're in a state of fear. They can't go anywhere. But the other thing that actually occurs, and I think this happens for a lot of us, is um, PMLD calls them partial boundaries. I call them fragmented, just, just saying. Not that I don't want to be uh, disagreeing with you here. I don't, but... But fragmented boundaries look like this. It's like, I go to work, uh, you know, the boss says to me, you know, I'm gonna, I want you to work these hours and I'm gonna pay you this and I'd like you to do that. And, you know, in a pretty functional way, we, we negotiate, you know? Yeah, I can do that, no, I can't. Yes, and it's, it's all very reasonable. So that's a functional boundary. But then I go home and I've got no boundaries in my intimate relationship. Maybe I never saw the model when I was a child. Nobody ever taught me. And so what I do is I say to my, uh, you know, I walk in and my, <laughs> my partner says to me, how was your day? Yeah, great, 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 right, great. You know, and I just keep walking through the house. You know, it's like I'm yesing them along. Yes, yeah, great, 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 great. What I really want to say is look, it was a really hard day and I'm really beat. And I'm wondering, could you make me a cup of tea and listen to me for 10 minutes? I just want to download the day, let it go, and then let's have a dinner or something. You know what I mean? But I don't ask for that. Oh, yeah, 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 keep going. What do I do? I've got fragmented boundaries. I'm functional at work because, you know, that's just, you know, it's easy. You know, I don't have a lot of skin in the game. I'm working, I'm getting paid, I'm doing the job I like, blah, blah, blah. I have a lot of skin in the game at home. I've never understood how to be really intimate with anybody. And I mean from a heart space. And so what I do is, I, yeah, 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 I'm good, 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 good. And what do I do? I go straight through the office and I turn on the computer and I buy $500 worth of shoes. Make me feel better. And when I do that, I feel better for about a minute And maybe I feel good when the shoes arrive in the post. But I'm still left with the unmet need. I still have no ability to ask for what I need and what I want. Because I have no boundaries at home, some boundaries at work. They're fragmented. And that's the trap. People have fragmented boundaries. They actually think they've got boundaries. They haven't got boundaries. They've got you know, some at work and none at home. If I do that too much in my relationship, I'll tell you what will happen, is that it'll go on for a little bit longer. I'm not asking for what I need. I'm not asking for anything. I'm not setting a boundary about what, what I'd like my partner to do or not do for me. And within a few months, I'm saying, you know, you never do what I want. You know, you never look after my needs and you never do this and you never do that. Poor, poor bloke has no idea what I'm talking about because I've never said anything. Do you see how integral boundaries are to create intimacy, to create compassion, as Brené Brown says, to be the one that can say, I can do this much, but I cannot do this much. I can look after myself, which will help me to look after you, but I can't look after you first. That fabulous analogy of put your own oxygen mask on first before you try and help other people. We have to live by it as therapists if we didn't you know, we wouldn't be able to be of any service to our clients. So in fact, in my view, we go to too vulnerable or invulnerable, we have a whole bunch of presenting problems that start to happen in our lives if they're not functional, and that can be addictions, mood disorders, process addictions. And what we need to do is get to a point where we can protect and contain ourselves. Now, I'm not sure if there's any um, questions coming through. Uh, I feel like I could kind of go on, but I might see if there's some questions. Mm, okay. Okay, what are the differences between boundaries and ultimatums? Oh, a wonderful question. 
So, um, well, boundaries are what allow us to breathe in our life is the best way to say it. What I can do, what I can't do. Where do I begin and end and where do you begin and end? You see, I think there's this sort of, you know, Disney view of life, particularly in relationships where we think, you know, we're going to come together and it's all going to be fabulous and da 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 and we're all we need, right? And so the relationship ends up like this, right? In a mesh, sort of messy stuff. And what we really want to do is come together because I'm putting into the relationship and you're putting into the relationship. We're both... We're both putting the energy into the relationship. If I'm delivering ultimatums, I'm walled, I'm massively controlling usually. It's like it's my way or the highway. Whereas boundaries allows me to tell you who I am, to explain to you how I feel, and to start to have a conversation with you about how we might meet one another from that space. What can I do if someone disrespects a boundary? Oh, wonderful, thank you. Um, <laughs> what's that great saying we quote all the time? Oh, yes. The only people who object to you setting a boundary are those who benefited from you having none. So, generally speaking, my, my experience and my understanding is that as we start to set boundaries in our life when we haven't done it before, it kind of gets, it can get clunky initially. Um, and I do think being able to say to someone, look, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm struggling to do this. I want to try and protect and contain. Well, I, you wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say protect and contain yourself. They'd think you were crazy. You might say, I want to actually start to learn how to set boundaries. I want to be able to be more compassionate. I want to meet you where you are. And I do think that when we actually get um, to the point where we can start having the conversations with our uh, loved ones about what's, um, you know, what we, how we want to set boundaries. We're actually inviting them to do the same thing. Um, okay. Different types of boundaries are internal, external, sexual. Uh, in, so Denise has said, internal walls, no one gets in and you don't get out. Wow, a game changer for that one. Thank you. You're welcome. How do you set boundaries for people with addictions? Whoa, that's a classy question. Okay, so I think the way we set boundaries with people with addictions is we get very clear about what is the, what's the deal breaker for us. If I'm in relationship, and I have been in relationship with people that have had addiction. My mother was a chronic alcoholic. My father was a chronic gambler. I had to be very clear with them that there were certain things that were not acceptable. For example, when I had my daughter many, many years ago now, I said to my mother, if you come to my home and you are drunk, I will put you back in that taxi. It was long before Ubers. I will put you back in the taxi and send you away because you are not doing to me. I didn't say this, but this is what I thought. You're not doing to her what you did to me. So it's very clear about that. And I'm, I am of the belief that when we're congruent about our boundaries, when what your head's saying and what your heart's saying is the same, they hear it. They hear it in a way because you're not prevaricating. Um, yes, it will be available for replay. It will be on our YouTube clip. Uh, Kate, hello Kate. Where does people pleasing, inability to say no fit into boundaries? Mm. Well, people pleasing, of course, falls into that category of being, of having no boundaries, doesn't it? Abil inability to say no, same thing. Because we're so worried about, well, I'm going to make up. We're so worried about not wanting to offend somebody, not somebody not liking us. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I am of the belief, and you've heard me say this before, Kate, it doesn't matter. You can talk to anyone about anything at any time. It's all in the delivery. It's in the delivery of how we say what we need to say. And sometimes, you know, I often say to clients, top and tail it. Sometimes we've got to say, um, you know, this is difficult for me to say this to you. I wonder if you could let me finish before you respond. You know, you kind of just quietly said, and I'm of the belief also that when you are talking with people that, with things that are a little bit 
difficult. Sometimes it's best to go for a walk and be outside and do it. Um, so boundaries will allow you to not be a people pleaser. And boundaries will allow you to say no if you need to. Because sometimes the no, you know, if, if someone asks me something and they say, no, I can't do that, and I know that that's congruent, then I trust the no, which means that when they do say yes, I can trust their yes. So that straight away I've got a lot of uh, transparency and trust in the relationship. Um, Kay, is there something I can do each day to work on setting my boundaries? Hmm. Yes. Get very clear about where you begin and end and where other people begin and end. And sometimes when we're learning to do this, I think it's good to have an advocate, to have, to have, a, you know, have a mentor, a go-to person that we can um, talk to about how to set it up. And, you know, quite honestly, Kay, when I first started trying to speak up for myself in a functional way, without being, you know, dictatorial or demanding, I had to actually write it down sometimes and practice. Uh, what are the healthy boundaries to have with an active addict? Oh, look, I would suggest, and that's Amy Louise, um, healthy boundaries with an active addict are to not put yourself in a position where you're going to be hurt or exposed to um, any ha very harmful fallout of their addiction. Um, okay, Lynn says, I say yes to things then since I'm in early recovery. I stress days prior to the event, right? I feel like I'm not being accountable. My head goes mad, yes. It's, that's a funny thing, isn't it? You want to go out and be part of, you say yes to the event, and then the event's coming out. I've got to tell you, Lynn, I'm not in early addiction, I'm not in early recovery anymore, and it still happens to me where I go, oh, why did I say yes? I would go to that, whatever it is. And then, you know, I get up and go because I try and keep my word these days and always have fun. Uh, and I do think what I what I learned to do in early recovery, because I'd say yes to everything and do what you've just uh, explained, I would actually say to someone, look, that's a great thing, thanks for being so generous and inviting me. Can I check my diary and come back to you? So I'd get time to think about um, whether I could manage it or not manage it. Um, hmm. Why should I be the one to set boundaries? Well, because you're worth it. Uh, and because to not set boundaries means we become trapped either in uh, a walled environment where I'm, where I'm stuck, alone, and isolated, or the other end of the spectrum, I give up everything and I feel like I'm being used by everybody, but the irony is that I've set up being used. Um, another one coming through is, I find it really hard to stick to my boundaries. What can I do better? Look, I'd say get support around it. And be very clear about why you're setting the boundary. Because sometimes we set them when we think that's what we've got to do, rather than set them to respect ourselves. Uh, Rosie said, I think half the battle is expressing the boundary. Yes. The other half is defining the boundary. Absolutely, Rosie. You're absolutely right about that. Expressing the boundary in that way, with the top and tailing, uh, helps, I think. What I'm going to ask you is in no way meant to offend you. I'm just trying to practice uh, setting my boundaries. I'm trying to uh, practice being true to myself. People always understand that, that sort of language. Uh, and then working on it from there. And the reality is if you set a boundary and it doesn't suit you, change it and set another one. It's like most of them are not life-threatening. Where do you start to break down walls? Romy, I just love this one. Thank you. When I came into early recovery, I was walled, 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 walled. And um, people, I, the mentor I was working with, uh, sponsor said to me, could we just do a brick at a time? 
could you take down one brink? And, um, and I could do that. I mean, I wasn't going to take a wrecking ball to the wall straight away, that's for sure. But I was going to take down just a brick at a time. Sometimes, you know, it's that analogy, isn't it? I say to clients, take one down one brick and have a look through. See, it's not so terrifying over there. Uh, what do you do when people don't respect your boundaries? Mm. I think you've got to have a look at the relationship. Personally, I mean, and it also depends what the boundary is. But as I said earlier, Amy, when people don't, you know, when I'm really congruent about what I need and want in a relationship, or what I, you know, how I need to, to protect and contain myself, people, they don't have to like it, but they get it because energetically it's congruent. So I think there's a lot about being very, very clear about what it is first. Sharon says, for me, it's hard to keep boundaries aspects except from, from the valuable and spontaneous aspects. Mm. E.g. self-esteem lets me know I'm worth setting a boundary for and spontaneity allows me to be flexible. Absolutely. I think there's, they don't stand in isolation. You're absolutely right, Sharon. They, they are connected very much to self-esteem and they are connected very much to the spontaneity and, and playfulness in life. Uh, P and Melody always used to say, you know, there's five nature of child, you know, the valuable, vulnerable, imperfect, dependent, spontaneous. Open. And she always said, if you can get on top of self-esteem and boundaries, you're more than halfway there to recovery from codependence. And I think that's a massive statement because there's another three values to come after self-esteem and boundaries. Uh, Beck, what would a boundary look like to prevent burnout when you're the carer parent of, for two young special needs kids? Well, wow. Hats off to you, Beck, if that's your ex life experience. I can only suggest that at some point, and, and when you've got special needs kids, I guess that you have to put them first a lot of the time. So you go second. I guess as parents, we do that sometimes. We do that a lot of the time. But at some point in any week, I say to most of the parents I work with, find some joy in the week for you. And it may be something simple, just something really simple. It might be watching a movie, it might be going for a walk, it might be any number of things, having a bath, God knows, I don't know. But I do think the boundary uh, for a, a parent with special needs children is to perhaps get some respite care and things like that so you can actually continue to not burn out because if we burn out, we have no value to them or ourselves come to that. Camilla, hello. After decades of people pleasing, it is a real struggle to know who I am and what I want in my life. How do I find out? Well... <laughs> Camilla, I would suggest South Pacific might be a very good place to start. I think we need to unpack our life history. I need to, we need to look at how we've ended up in the space we are, uh, you know, what's brought us to the stage. And a lot of people make the mistake of saying, why, why, why am I in this and why am I and why am I? And I say to clients, do not ask why, you will not get an answer that's, make, that's of any value. You have to reframe. What is it about me that continues to keep me in this cycle? Or conversely, how is it that I find myself in this position? What is it about me that keeps me in this cycle and how is I find? And that's more open-ended in terms of trying to work out who you are. Most people in life, it strikes me, they know what they don't want. They know what they don't like. So that's a, sometimes a place to start if you've got no idea. Well, I don't want this, I don't want this, and I don't want this. Okay, fine. Well, you know, we've got to get to a point where we find out something that we do like and we do love about doing uh, things in our life for ourselves. Kim says, how do I express my boundaries clearly when another has walls firmly in place and believes I have no boundaries and always step too close? Hmm. When another has walls firmly in place and believes I have no boundaries, my step too close. I would suggest that there's probably something about the other part of, our, and we're not going into it tonight, Kim. 
you know, is once we've done the work on the childhood, then we look at how we show up in our relationships. And this sounds very much like um, living in a bit of a love avoidant, love addiction cycle, or in some respects, Gottman call it the pursue a distance of relationship. So when you've got someone in your life telling me you're going too, you're coming too close, it's like, hang on a second, I'm just trying to show up. Maybe there, maybe there is, you know, there's a dance going on. That's what that sounds to me. I don't know. I think all we can do in terms of expressing our boundaries is what's, what's the bottom line for you? Like what's not negotiable in the relationship? And we do have them. Dimmy has said, no one prepares you for the consequences of boundaries. You know who your real tribe is once you learn to say no, absolutely. I find it hard to accept a slander lies malice for saying no. I won't accept being physically, verbally, emotionally, financially abused. I agree, nor should any of us. We are worthy of love and care and attention and we're allowed to be who we are. And provided we're not trying to hurt anybody else, then it's not acceptable accepting abuse at any level from anybody. And I think from the sound of that question and that comment, you know that. So we've probably come to the end of the time. I'm sorry we've gone on a bit longer than I expected. I invite you to have a look at uh, boundaries in your world, see where you begin and end. I invite you to think about what your life might look, how different it might look if your boundaries allowed you to be more compassionate with the people around you and with yourself, because you're worth it, I'm worth it, we're all worth it. Uh, thank you for tuning in today, tonight, and, uh, and we'll catch up with you at our next Facebook Live. Signing off.